Welcome to Voices of the West. Today, we have the honor of talking with Dave Fisher, the probably best-selling author we currently have at Dusky Saddle, and you have been in the top 10 consistently for the last six months. Your Seaver Long Rider series has been there for a good year since it's been going and still has legs on it, and you are just all over the place on the charts. Dave, thank you. Well, Welcome. thank you. <laughs> If it wasn't for all the work you people do at Dusty Saddles, it wouldn't be there. Well, we appreciate you being here very much. So tell me a little bit here. We've we spoke before on things, but the the uh, transmission got a little bit messed up on things. Give me a little bit of your background of what got you into westerns. Uh, born and raised western, uh, raised in Oregon back in the days when Oregon was still cowboy and and lumber and that. And when I got out of high school, I went uh, just kind of mountain manning for a while. And then I got into uh, cowboy. I got into rodeo, did a lot of rodeo work, uh, bronc riding. Uh, then I decided to start learning how to be a packer in the backcountry. And so I spent quite a few years packing for hunting outfitters and uh, worked up in Alaska, the Alaska bush, um, the wilderness areas of Montana. Wyoming, Colorado. I ended up packing for the National Park Service in Colorado in Rocky Mountain National Park. And so everything was pretty much always cowboy. If I could do it on the back of the horse, I, that's what I did. And then when I was 31, I just gotten married and uh, we moved from Colorado back to Oregon. And I went back to work for the cattle company I'd worked for before. And so one day we were working cattle off the mountain and the boss wanted me to start training this little three-year-old that uh, said, we need to teach him how to work cattle. So get him up in the hills and working. Well, he was doing fine until all of a sudden he decided he didn't want to play anymore. And anybody who spent a lot of time around three-year-old horses, when they decide they don't want to play, they don't play. And so he's, so we're on this little bitty trail with a 20-foot clip on, on one side, and he started to buck. Well, we're not going to buck. We're going to stop this, right? Now, we're not going to play this game. So he decided, well, since I can't buck, I'll just throw myself over backwards. So he threw himself over backwards. We went over the cliff. He landed on me. And about three years later, I was able to start walking. again. That kind of took me out of the cowboy business. And besides that, with the new family, it, you know, cowboy doesn't pay. It's very poor pay. So I had to get other work. and. Uh, but then I had all that experience. So I really missed cowboy. I was like, well, what, what can I do with all this experience and all these things that I know? Well, maybe I should start to write because I was a big fan of Louis L'Amour. I was like, I can write like that. Well, it took me a long time before I could write like Louis L'Amour. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's what got me started writing because I decided, well, I, I can tell these stories too, but it took, it took a while to learn how to do it right. Absolutely. So you've had the entire Western experience. You've had, you know what it smells like, you know what it tastes like, you know, all that kind of thing for what's going on for everything here. What really inspires you about being in the West? It's it's the real country. Right now, I've retired to um, with my family, to, with my wife, to Arkansas. So Arkansas is the gateway to the West anyway, and we really like it here. We love it. Um, but the West is... West hasn't changed a lot. The Cowboy West, anyway, to get out of the cities. No, the Cowboy West hasn't changed a lot. The attitude's the same, pretty much the same. What inspires me most about the West is it's real. The people are real. There's no, there's no phony. It's like what you see is what you get. And the country, and the country is unique. The big mountains, the prairies, the sagebrush, the hot areas, the cold areas. You know, the mountains straight up, and it's just a real country and i love it and so it's easy to work all that into stories so what i try to do with my books and my stories is work that feeling into the story you know you, you it's one thing to describe it it's another thing to live it and then kind of paint the picture so and that's the kind of thing people commented before <clears throat> is that you paint a picture i can feel that i'm there Mm -hmm. So that's what I try to do is let people know this is the West I know so well. And so I paint the picture and apparently I, I'm 
I'm painting it right because people are saying, yeah, yeah, I can feel it. So, yeah, and people are responding definitely to everything you put out. That's we we just launched your latest book, but on Friday, and you're already pushing mm -hmm. number six and higher on everything. So, congratulations again on that, as always. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, I guess people liked it. So, yeah. So let's go into your series a little bit on things. We, we started out with Stephen Longrider on those things. What got you, what, what brought that whole entire series to mind and what are you planning on going to in the future with it? Um, it I've wrote a couple different series on, uh, I have a personal imprint that I have been writing out for until before I started with uh, Dusty Saddles. Now I'm just writing exclusively for Dusty Saddles. But uh, I had several, uh, series is, and I like to write a series and keep it going. <clears throat> and uh, excuse me. And it's you it, by writing a series, you get people invested in the characters, and you want people to feel like they're part of the story, that they're part of that group of characters. That's why I like a series because you can keep it going and you can keep building and uh, keeping the time time alive. You keep moving with the time. And so that's what I like about writing a series. Seaver and Long Rider, uh, I came up with the idea about um, I wanted to do another series. And I wanted it to be, I don't like to do traditional, you know, like Hollywood cowboy. What I like to do is the life and times of the West. You know, it's like taking a snippet out of 1873 or whatever year and telling the story of what people did at that time and how they lived. And so I I started with that with the concept of you know Jack Seaver is a guy who's troubled about his past. He has a past that he has he's running from, and so he keeps and he he doesn't want to be friends with anybody anymore. And so he starts encountering these people that start to change his life, and then he encounters Long Rider, who was a uh, crow, crow scout for uh, General Gibbons at the time of the Custer uh, massacre. And he gets disgusted with the fact that the army can't beat the Sioux and the Crow hate the Sioux. That, that's always been the case. So he leaves and eventually he goes to stealing horses and Jack gets a job with deputy sheriff and catches him stealing horses. And so they kind of come up with this mutual trust, distrust, Okay, yeah, well, you help me, I'll help you catch these horse thieves. And and it, it turns into a partnership. And it just keeps growing from there. And that's the concept I started with. And so the two characters just kind of keep growing from there. Very much. Where are we looking with that? Because I know we, I believe Assassins was the last book on that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was number eight. Uh, it'll continue on. It's, it's, mm -hmm. There's more story to tell, and what I keep doing is just I'm building it up with the history. Basically, he's he's it's building around the history of Fort Worth, mm -hmm. and so it's Fort Worth at its very beginning because they he's on this big ranch outside of Fort Worth, and they're building a racetrack. And at one time there was there was a big racetrack in Texas until Texas outlawed horse racing, and then but at this point in time they're building that. So there, there's a lot to go on. Absolutely. So go, let's go into the other series now. <laughs> okay. I was say, do we want to learn some little bit about the research there, or do we want to go into your your current series? But let's let's transition to your current series at the moment, since we're talking books. All right. <laughs> so uh, the return of Travis Walker. I mean, what? Where does this one come from? Because this is more of a he's coming back, mountain manny kind of a thing, as opposed to a straight cowboy kind of a thing, right there. Which again, right. these are straight cowboys for you. <laughs> Right. So the history of the West started with the Mountain Man. You know, when Lewis and Clark, you know, went West in 1804, 1803, they opened up the West and they opened up the way for Mountain Men to come. And when they came back to the reports of, you know, there's all these beaver to trap, there's all this going on. And England started getting uh, infatuated with the beaver skin hat. Well, the West is full of beaver. We go out there and start trapping those and make money. And so the West opened up with the mountain men. And so for me, with the fascination I have with the West and the love I have with the West, it only, it's only right to start it from the beginning. 
this is where it started from. It started with people like <clears throat> it started with people like Travis Walker. It started with the mountain man. It started with these people that blazed the trails, who who, who learned, you know, who found where uh, South Pass was, who learned, uh, okay, we don't want to go over this pass, but we'll go over that pass. Uh, we're going we're going to discover and explore this river. Uh, this river, you know, like the Snake River, was a, there was a lot of exploring on the Snake River, but it bordered uh, Hudson Bay Company country. So there's there's the issue with Hudson Bay, doesn't want American trappers over there, but American trappers are like, well, there's a lot of people over there. So it's, it's pretty much basically uh, a bunch of mountain men and the kind of lives they lived at the time and the kind of experiences they had. So basically, I'm just taking, uh, once again, a snippet of history from the 1830s and building this group of people around it. And so the, so it's, it's more historical than anything. This is what happened. This is what the country looked like. The, you know, these are the trails like the, I forget which one, I think it was the, the third book where um, in the back, I always put a, a historical note in the back because uh, I, I like that to, you know, take something that's in the story that's historical and then tell the actual thing about it at the back so this one was they their route from uh the platte river all the way to uh where the snake goes into columbia mm -hmm. and so what i did was i i traced that route on the modern or it is modern day where the cities and towns are now so you could follow the route and so they actually you know, did these are routes they actually use so mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've walked the santa fe trail i've walked the oregon trail you know I, i've trapped beaver on the same streams that you know these people did uh, i hunted the same country i rode over the same country i rode through the rocky mountains where the mountain men were through through um, uh the teton country i've been all over that so i could if i could just put myself in their place and go this is what it was like then Mm -hmm. And so that's why I just want to tell people a story of this is what it was like, and this is what the people were like. So tell me a little bit going into the process for writing the books on things here. How much research are you putting into these? Where does that fit before you start diving into the book? Uh, I do a tremendous amount of research because I want to get it right. Uh, internet's been great for that. Prior to the internet, you had to try to figure it out for yourself. And it's like, oh man, I can't find anything else. But the internet is so easy to look up stuff. I like what I like to do is I pull up the old maps. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of old maps that are online. And so you find out what the real names of the streams were, what the real names of the places were, what was there, what wasn't there. And uh, so you get a lot of accuracy by pulling up the old maps. Mm -hmm. And then I draw in a lot of my own experience of what I remember of it. Uh, I, I also use um like aerial, aerial and uh, uh, aerial footage to look at what the country looks like. Okay, so this is this is sagebrush country, this is mountain country. Okay, yeah, I remember that it was this and that was that. So a lot of the places I've talked about, they're describing are places I've been, and other places, you know, I I check it on aerial maps and that. So I try to get everything right. Uh, I'll 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 do as much minute uh, research as I can to make sure that something they're using or something they're doing actually existed at that time. So I don't I don't get it in the wrong place. And I've done that in the past when I first started writing, got some things wrong. And so I've been very careful since then. Okay, no matter how minute the detail is, I gotta make sure it's right. And so basically the story writes itself. I start out with a concept and I start writing the story. And as I'm writing it, I go, Oh, wait, wait, it would be much better if they did this. So I'll go back and I'll change it. And then I get through and say, oh, wait, if, oh, this, oh, this is a much better way to do it. And so I'll go on with that. And then at the end, of, when I write the first draft, I'll go back and I'll do what I call my, my continuity review. And I'll make it all match up to what I finally ended up doing. <laughs> and then I do the next edit. And that's basically to uh, paint the color in. And the third edit, I go through to make sure I haven't made any mistakes, but I I still miss some. <laughs> <laughs> happens to everybody on all of that. <laughs> Plus, you're talking about a time in history where innovation and everything was new, everything was being invented at that time. And between just the time period of 1870 to 1890, vastly different world. Oh yeah, oh yeah. The the whole country changed in that period from uh, 
from the time Lewis and Clark went through the Louisiana Purchase to the turn of the century, 1900. Yeah. And the whole country did. I mean, there was a a migration, uh, an exploration, a uh, just a discovery in the, in the West from everything from the Mississippi to the Pacific that took place in that less than 100 years. Absolutely. And that's something that will never, ever be repeated in history anywhere ever again. So that has to be kept and it has to be captured, and but it has to be done accurately. Hollywood's done a wonderful job of making it really inaccurate. <laughs> but it's <clears throat> fun. <laughs> they make it fun, but it's like, yeah, that's not how it was. <laughs> Very true on that. <laughs> so for you, what's the best advice anyone has ever given you for writing? Um, No one's ever really given me advice. I've given myself advice. I'm my own worst critic. I I am really all over myself on what I do. Uh, the most important thing is don't get your head so big you think you're too good to ever get better because you can always improve. Because I look at stuff I wrote when I first started writing. All new writers have this attitude like, oh, I, I wrote that so good. Nobody can ever change it because it's so good. So I go back after years later and look at it. And go, wow, this is real trash. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was good. It's terrible. So you you got to keep your feet on the ground and your head out of the clouds, and, and be honest about critiquing yourself, how you're writing. And so for me, my own best advice is, you know, don't think you're so great, don't so smart that you can't improve because you can always improve. You can always get better. And that's why my writing has improved over the years is I have that attitude. It's like, I'll look at something like that's I can do better with that. that. That's not, that's a little, you know, that I need, I need a more dramatic verb. You know, I need a better sentence. I didn't describe this better. I don't like, I have no problem with wiping out a couple of pages and go, that, that's, that's no good. I got to do this over. I have no problem with that. I know some writers have a type of thing that if they use the same word more than three times in a chapter, they won't use the word again. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I try not to overdo it. But sometimes, sometimes it's a good word. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, definitely there. What do you think is the most challenging part of writing a book? Uh, coming up with a concept, coming up with a plot. That's the most difficult part because I don't want to keep doing the same plot because there are like five basic plots you know you got to have a protagonist you got to have an antagonist and you got to have a conflict those are three things you have to have to make the story interesting uh so you got to find different ways of using those three elements because the plots are basically the same but if you keep doing the same plot and that's what you know you see a lot with uh, some western writers is it's the same thing over and over and over and over again all they do is change the names well, it's got to be better now or people are going to get bored. So I, because, because the West is so fast and because there's so much history in it, you can use the same concepts. You can use the same plots and make a totally different story. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. It's like, how can I make this a different story? And I'll come up with an idea and I'll just kind of start messing with it. And it has a tendency to take on a life of its own. It's like, okay, what would they do next? Okay, so I wrote this part. What would they naturally do next? What what should they do next that's interesting? How can I keep the how can I keep the action going? How can I keep the interest going? So that's the hardest part is is actually just structuring the story. Mm -hmm. Do you work with outlines? Do you just do lines of notes, or do you just kind of have the idea of where you're going to and aim to get there? That one. <laughs> it's like I got I come up with an idea and I just start writing and it's like and that's why it changes so much as I go along it's like okay uh it would be better if they did this or it would be better if they did that so I'm gonna go back and change that and so I just it's just too kind of, easy. Like, let's do something different <laughs> what's that the solution was too easy let's do something different yeah 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 I go oh it'd be more I try I try to throw twists in I try to throw a little mystery in it, some twists in it, so that people are like, well, who did it? Who is this guy? What are they doing? So you got to read all the way through the story to find out. Then I tie it all up at the end. 
the the three the first uh, two uh, Travis Walker books are meant to end with an open end to go into the next book. Uh, probably 98% of the people are like, oh, that was really cool. And then the other 2% are like, you didn't finish the book. It's like, it's a trilogy. It's not supposed to. <laughs> it's, it's supposed trilogy, to be open. And end. then yeah, a trilogy is a good trilogy always has four books. And then a really good one has five. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so I, uh, when it's a standalone book, I always tie up all the threads at the end. Mm-hmm. And so the fourth book is a standalone, so all of the uh, threads are tied up at the end. Oh. For the first three are an ongoing trilogy. Now the the group is settled in the West, settled in the Rocky Mountains, and now they're just going to do stuff, mm-hmm. get it, get into things, take care of things, and that's where it's going to go from here. And they're all going to be standalone books from here on out. Very good. So what are you working on at the moment? At the moment. I just finished uh, Trapper's Law, <laughs> and so I'm taking I'm taking a little bit of a break, and then uh, I'll start on the next Seaver Long Rider. So what I'll do is I'll do a Seaver Long Rider, then a Travis Walker, then a Seaver, then a Travis, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna hip hop them like that. Very good. Tell us a little bit about Trapper's Law, being that that just hit the the charts here just this last week, uh-huh. and already flying up to number one as we get there. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's it starts out with the same group, uh, the the same three main characters, Travis and Martin and Nick. So they they've stayed together, and plus all their buddies, all the other trapper buddies who are kind of funny. I like to throw a lot of humor in, humor in my stories. I always throw humor, and uh, so they have they tell funny stories and and uh, kind of needle each other about things. You know, keep, you know, like real people, like real guys do. And uh, so this one is they're they're uh it it start it's it starts rather historical because uh, Nathaniel Wythe uh, was took an expedition or a trapping expedition to the Oregon Territory, and he brought some uh, missionaries with him. And so in this case, what I did was I threw in a, an extra an extra person that was uh, that would hooked up with the missionaries but he has his wife and daughter with them and they're all and the trappers are like why would anybody bring a woman and children out to this country you know it's full of dangers hostile engines you know the black feet will get them and kill them it's like why are they here so they started taking interest in why why are you here and they want to try to get him to go back with them and so one thing leads to another and then this other guy shows up and goes well wow, he, he's running from the law and well actually the story goes on to find out what is actually going on with all these people. But it started, it's historical as to, you know, Weiss' expedition and the fact that he did bring missionaries with him. So it kind of, kind of a spinoff from that. Excellent. Well, speaking of characters on things as we go here, my understanding is that uh, certain Dave Fisher ended up inside of a Jubal Stone book lately. <laughs> Have you heard on that one? <laughs> No, it's oh, written oh, in oh. as a, a specific character in there. Oh yes, yes. Uh, Casey Nashes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Nick told me that he was doing a cameo. Well, he's got a cameo in Trapper's Law. Oh, very good. He, he's he's gonna he's one of the trappers that that uh, makes some significant uh, uh, plot points. Mm-hmm. So. So he he's in that too. So so we exchange cameos. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so you're all kind of intertwining together now. <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? We're all in the same. Why not? Team. Yeah, exactly. It makes it more fun for everybody. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like this idea. There's a lot of writers, in particular in the Western genre, that think they're a whole lot more than they are. And so they're above everybody else. I don't like that. Because we're we're all, I mean, if you can write better than me, if your book can get advanced farther than mine, good for you. That mm-hmm. means you wrote a better book than I. Did. Good for you. Go for it. You know. And uh, so I sold some of my books at number one for a long time. Then they started to fade off. Somebody else jumps in there. It's like, hey, I had a good run. Now it's your turn. Yeah. And that's how I feel about it. We all need to work together on this. I I have no, I do not have a big head on anything. So. <laughs> 
I was, take everything with I take everything with humor, and if you don't take it with humor, then uh, yeah, well, just go lay out in the yard. <laughs> what do you think has contributed to your success? Because you have had a very long run of excellent books of excellent sales going on in them. Uh, I think I think more than anything is putting the authenticity into it because I've lived so much of it that I can describe. I mean, like I'll describe what. I'll describe a storm rolling across the prairie in Wyoming. I've been stuck in those, and they're vicious. They blow. They roll up black. Just saw the the whole world turns black, and the lightning starts sh shooting out of it, and the thunder just shakes the ground, and the animals run, and everything runs except for the cowboy out there. It's like I really have no place to run to, so I'm putting on my slicker. I get hunker down in my slicker. And here comes the rain, and it's and it's a frog drought, and it pours out, and then it starts to hail, and then it beats you with the hail, and then it rolls on by, and the sun comes back out, and you're sitting there like, "Wow, I'm doing this for ten dollars a day." Wow, <laughs> but I can describe that. So I think that's the fact that I, I use a lot of history in it, and I keep the history going, and the fact that I can put the authenticity into it. And the fact that I have been writing long enough to make it an interesting story. And I think that's just, I think that's what people like because a lot of the comments I get on the reviews is they like the history, they like the feel that they feel like they're part of the story, and mm -hmm. that's what I want to try to impart is I'm going to put you in the story because when I when I was younger and I was reading stories before I thought about writing, is I would get invested in the book and with the characters and especially when I was a kid I feel like I was part of that story. And I thought, when I start writing, that's what I want to impart. I want you to feel like you are in this group. Mm -hmm. Be completely immersive to it and make people part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, we've got Trepper's Law out now. What, do you, what are you working on? What you, that puts you into the realm of Seaver that you're going to be starting on. Where do you think it's going to be going? Uh, it's going to go, at, at this point, he, they have made a partnership with the old racetrack in Louisiana and out of Baton Rouge. And so they're going to be, and also he has rekindled his love with his old plane that was there. And so I, that's going to play into it. And plus you got the own racetrack they're trying to build. And then there's going to be some bad guys who are going to come in and just try to mess things up. And then, and, and, and Seaver and Long Rider are like, no, you're not going to mess this up. We're going to go take you out. <laughs> that's where that one says that's the next step and and fort worth will continue to build a little bit more you know the train just came through the train just reached fort worth is heading on west and so the history continues but uh you don't you don't mess with those guys because you mess with those guys you mess with their families you mess with their with their property and you will not like the results <laughs> indeed but people are enjoying watching your results on all of that. So all of yeah, these yeah. are available on Amazon. Anywhere else we can learn more about you? Um, not really. It's, I, I had a website for a while. <clears throat> I had a GoDaddy, and then they changed the formatting and said, well, you can't have this website like this anymore. And I had years, and it was easy to work on, easy to build, keep it up to date. Well, you can't have this anymore. you got to have this other really crappy website. I said, well, I don't want that website. So, well, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll, you, we'll change everything over for you. Okay, I'll take, I'll try it. So I got the website. It was like $92 for the year. Got the website and it was horrible. And they transferred nothing of my other one over. I thought you could transfer it. Oh, we did. I uh, know there's nothing there. And so trying to rebuild it and it was so horrible. You couldn't work with nothing. It was absolute garbage. So, uh, the, so when the year was up, they tried to build me an extra 50% on it. And I said, no, I don't want it. So I just canceled it. So at this point, I haven't been able to find anybody who, who could give me a decent website to build because I want to build it myself. I don't like other people doing it. So I was able to get, you know, get a lot of my stuff out on that. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much, you know, uh, Amazon and, and Dusty Saddles is pretty much where you can hear about me now. Well, again, we are very happy to have you on board and continue to sell your books as they come out and always something to look forward to on that. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate everything that you do for us, for me. And uh, you make great covers. <laughs> uh, you know, no, your, your covers, really, your covers 
sell the book because they look good. They look like me. I like a. I look at a cover, and if the cover looks really cheesy, it's like well, the book's probably cheesy. But if the cover is interesting and it looks kind of like the story, I'm like, ooh, maybe I'll check this story out because the cover looks good, and all the covers you do look really great. And uh, I like I like I like the tone it gives the book. It makes me want to pick it up and read it. So I appreciate that. I appreciate everything that everybody else is doing there. Yeah, you know, all the work Nick's doing. Nick's a great guy. And so thank you to everybody at Dusty Silos Production. I appreciate everything. You do. Our pleasure. And I appreciate you taking the time to talk, talk with all of us today. Well, thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> <laughs> Always a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.